So, all right, welcome everybody to day number eight, take two. So, uh, for those who did not see the announcement video before this one, um, the long story short is I did a, I did a stream on Thursday, that was two days ago, uh, at a humane time for Europeans. And uh, like for just about the first half, I tripped all over my own feet. Then I managed to pick up, get a good deal done, uh, and I had promised that I would have done some um, some uh, Maya noddling, some you know cleaning up the rigs and uh, getting things back together, reordering transforms and stuff like that. And then I would have explained like the applied math uh, part of it. And I thought it was a great idea. It turns out it was a terrible idea actually, uh, because what happened is that. Um, uh, that basically, as I was trying to get things done, I was trying to explain just the minimum necessary. It was uh, it was not working out. Uh, now the stream in general uh, is not going to be on YouTube because what I've decided to do is uh, swap those days. So basically, I'm going to do uh, some basic math, the applied part for it today, and then tomorrow uh, we are actually going to be. Uh, rewiring the graph and doing actual rigging with the stuff that we have learned and all of that. So, uh, usual thing, like the chat is my sounding board. If you hear audio issues, please let me know. If something is not clear, uh, I normally do take a peek at the chat uh, fairly often, just ask away. And that's it. So I reckon we can start with it. And okay, so to begin with, um, there are several branches of mathematics, nothing new. Algebra is one of the most primitive ones. It establishes, uh, and I think we've gone over that, it establishes a lot of basic operations and a lot of language. Uh, set theory or, you know, part of discrete mathematics or the other way around, depending which angle you look at it from, is another very, very primitive, uh, as in very foundational uh, mathematical discipline then you start having sort of layers that use those operations and maybe introduce their own notions. So uh, calculus is uh, one of those first tier layers. Uh, trigonometry is building on top of algebraic operations. And the long story short about trigonometry is that it's a study and solution of triangles. And the study of solution of triangles also basically means that it's a study of solution of pretty much all angles. Linear algebra is kind of sideways and it's basically the idea of applying algebraic notions to systems rather than to individual items. So if you have a single item in a field that's a scalar, the field itself is a vector or a matrix uh, and so on. What we are going to start with is trigonometry and this is for um, one good reason well a it's pretty primitive it's pretty um it doesn't it doesn't really require prior knowledge of anything uh, but the other thing is i've seen a lot of people getting into the uh linear linear algebra slash matrix uh side of things and at that point they think they get everything about transforms and you will see some of the most obscene convoluted multiplications and remultiplications and stuff like that inside rigs because everybody tries to do these things like if the matrices described in the transforms are some sort of primitive and they're not. Matrices and linear algebra uh, deal with systems that have a linear behavior. <coughs> Sorry, scratchy throat. Um, but the primitive operations in there are algebraic and whenever it comes to rotations, there's a ton of, uh, there is a ton of trigonometry in there. And what happens is that when people just use flat out matrices, square 16 pieces matrices all over, it's a ton of wasted calculations. So a lot of people think that linear algebra is almost an upgrade over trig and they don't need the, uh, they don't need the latter. That is absolutely not true. Uh, so it becomes even more true when you actually want to write optimal code or even just not horrible code. Uh, but it's pretty important to have that understanding. Even if you're just using vanilla Maya, it's an important tool to rationalize problems. So 
the other part to this rambling session is um, I think I need to take a step back on one thing which is you hear me very often to mention custom nodes uh, and that is because I am a fluent enough programmer that for me there's um, there's a lot of problems where I'll just go in and write something it's for me it's like putting a C++ expression between two end bits somewhere uh, it doesn't mean that you absolutely have to do that for absolutely optimal performance yes you have to um, Python for performance just not an option uh, but it doesn't mean and this is the point of uh, not starting with code it's of, you know starting with just vanilla my and the mathematics behind all of these is uh, to give people foundations then if you can write code that condenses or expands on what you already know that's great but it is not necessary the uh, the math part is a lot more important than the code part so with that long rambling session out of the way uh, trigonometry so study of triangles and that pretty much means the study of um, of all angles because any given angle is gonna be something between points so you'll find a number of different conventions in trigonometry and I did mention when you look at transforms you will often see and this is just for you to be able to read notation if you ever read a paper or something whenever there's an angle between items it's often indicated with a, a theta and, uh, and that is usually the case for transforms or efforts or stuff like that in pure trigonometry the angles inside of a triangle are usually going to be indicated with uh, with Greek letters so you're going to have uh, half a beta gamma for the three angles uh, so very often you will find that the um, the traditional alphabet uh, uppercase letters are going to be the vertices and the lowercase letters are going to be the sides now more importantly the first part of trig that we're interested in is going to be right triangles and a right triangle is simply a triangle that has one of the angles at 90 degrees if you use degrees and not radians so step back as we said before the idea is we keep de-escalating things until we got to the uh, very basics of everything so the notion of radians versus degrees which is where unit conversion nodes in Maya come from now the idea is that you have a unit circle I'm not gonna even try this I actually had a scene set up in Maya for this I'm gonna do and use that so um, you will see two kind of angles usually and that's degrees and radians there's other systems as well uh, and it basically depends on how you divide the circle and there is the notion of a unit circle which is okay I gotta switch mental gear um, into gears for a sec and change all the shortcuts in my head so there is a notion of how you divide the unit circle and whenever and we've seen these a lot whenever you connect things that are let's just get as a couple groups uh, whenever you connect things that are not of the same unit type in Maya you get those ugly unit conversion nodes so where do they come from and what do they contain uh, another quick note on that stream that I am not going to put on YouTube there were actually a couple of good questions which is the other reason why I am redoing that stream as two proper streams uh, so whenever you do something like this you will actually get a unit conversion node in between and there is a good reason for that to happen uh, well arguably a good reason there is a logical reason for it and similarly you will get one if you do something like this and if you look at those unit conversion nodes what you see inside changing is the conversion factor now there was a pretty good point uh, the other day uh, on that infamous stream which is somebody was asking oh sometimes I just uh, change the number in here is that okay yes it's absolutely okay uh, this is a normal Maya node in most regards it just happens to implement a couple callbacks where if it is uh, disconnected in some ways it should delete itself Maya has a bunch of event loops that will take care of it but it's a normal node and if it's converting between angles and floats 
all it is doing is basically introducing a factor in there. So it's taking a number, multiplying it by that factor and pushing it out. Uh, obviously, it's also changing the type of that port going out. And when you see a black port, it means that it's a port that can be in several types. And that's pretty much it for what you need to know about this. Now, those conversion factors actually come from the relationship between degrees and radians. Let me just click my way around. And by the way, chat, let me know how it works for the screen resolution and all, because the text might be tiny, but this is so much more comfortable for me. And I was saying, actually, we can do that here. I was saying there's, there's a unit circle, which is what we are interested in here. So the idea of a unit circle is purely that it's a circle and that the radius, which is this part here, is going to be of uh, uh, length one. So that's the radius. Now, there's a constant that hopefully people are familiar with, which is pi. Uh, but I am going to assume that people are not familiar with it. And so if the radius is one, then actually let me switch the tablet. So if the radius is one, the idea is that the half circumference, which is the, uh, the circle length, I guess you could call it that, the half circumference is gonna be uh, equal to pi. And that is a constant, it's known, and it's literally the relationship between two, uh, between these uh, two items, so the radius and the half circumference and it's uh, 3.14159 something. There are some people that have memorized these to thousands of digits. I'm not one of them. Uh, and it's often approximated. Uh, most of the time you will see when you're doing maths and paper, you will see it done like that. So uh, there's also arguments about whether pi should actually be uh, double pi. So you have the full circumference. We're not gonna engage in those. Uh, so the full circumference of a circle is actually 2 pi. Now, one quick thing, when you see expressions like this, uh, when you see an equation like this, um, I'm not going to engage into something that is probably fifth or sixth grade math, but uh, we're going to use it a lot now. So when you have something like this, so, and I should say this is half the circumference, if you see pi equals half the circumference of the circle, uh, you can move things uh, between sides. That's, uh, that's how you deal with equations. And when you cross the side, uh, you, if, it's, um, if it's an addition, you negate the sign. If it's a multiplication, uh, you negate whether it's uh, the denominator the, uh, or not. So in this case, it will be to get rid of these two you will basically port it across here. So it becomes that two pi equals uh, one C, which is my circumference. So that one is irrelevant, which means that a circumference is two pi. Uh, this is super, super basic, but I'm doing it because it will come into play as soon as we look at some rules. I am assuming it is all still making sense up to here. And I have to admit to having sort of a script at hand because I am hoping to get a good amount of ground cover today. Now, that is all you need to know about the unit circle itself. So the next thing is there are functions tied to the unit circle and there are angles that relate to it. So radians and degrees. Um, the idea of degrees is that as you run down the circumference, it is measured from zero, which is here, to the end, which is here. Uh, in radians, this is going to be 2 pi, which is what we say. So when you see radian, when you see radians, uh, what you get is that at this point, the quarter circle is going to be half pi. Actually, let me erase or more. I can just get a, a new chunk here. So when you see radians, you're going to find that this is zero, that this is going to be half pi, that this is going to be pi and this is gonna be 1.5 pi, and this is gonna be two pi. Now, when you see degrees, um, for more comfortable numerical usage, somebody thought that the circle might actually be divided in 360 discrete sections. So you're at zero here. Uh, if you're in radians, you are, can I, let's leave, let's leave dangerously. Let's zoom out in Maya and in the canvas as well. Let's see what happens with that. 
It happens that I apparently can't zoom out further than that. All right, we'll do the radiance inside. So in this case, what we have is zero here, 90 here, and 180 here. And this is probably what you are most familiar with if you've uh, not done much math before. Uh, I will wager you probably heard of this. So there is a relationship between, obviously enough, between degrees and radians, and that is gonna be that if two pi is equals to 360, or if you want to have the easier version, you can have that pi is equal to 180, and you need to convert between the two, uh, you can do things like one divided uh, by 180, it's gonna, gonna, it's gonna get to the relationship with pi, so that is gonna be 3.14 divided by 180. It's gonna get to the relationship the other way, uh, sorry, one way, and the opposite, so 180 divided by 3.14 is gonna get to the relationship in the other direction, which are the numbers that we were actually seeing in uh, those unit conversions now. Is there a reason you're counting from the vertical y-axis instead of the x-axis for your starting position? Yes, that's a good question actually, and I will get into it later. There's two ways of looking at the unit circle, and it depends entirely on convention. You will find, um, like in the math books I had when I was a kid, you will, like, uh, you will find that trigonometry for architecture is, like the convention is that, it's clockwise rotations starting from the azimuth and that is because a lot of it is relative to the azimuth so it's relative to the position of the sun and stuff like that and people are concerned with where the center of the sky is some other times you will find the unit circle starting from here and going down in that direction which is more common for uh, when you get closer to the math and what we will actually do in Maya is we're gonna have this unit circle running counterclockwise, and I will explain that, and that's got to do with left-handed and right-handed uh, coordinates. Hopefully that makes sense and it's enough of an explanation. You don't really care all that much when you're doing it in the abstract, you do care a great deal when you're doing it for transforms. Let me know if it doesn't make sense. For now, I am gonna move on. I'm gonna zoom in so that I can zoom out later. And all right, that's some big ass letters I have around now. That will be okay. So moving on, uh, there are some pretty important functions, which is what we wanted to get to, I guess. And that is right triangles have a very specific relationship. Now the important bit about the unit circle in many ways when you construct right triangles from it is that it basically establishes the, that the hypotenuse of something is always gonna be one, and that simplifies a lot of calculations. So there are three super important functions, there's a lot more than that, but there are three important functions we care about, which is uh, sine and cosine and tangent. Now for each of those you have, um, uh, I'm not going to start using function notation. For each of those, you also have the opposite one. So all of these are functions of an angle. And if you don't know what a function is in abstract terms, don't worry. It is not something that's absolutely necessary for now. And what they actually represent is uh, over the unit circle is the length of a side of a triangle. And that is what we're going to show. So this is gonna take an angle in here, so this might actually be in radians, and it's gonna give you a real number that is always gonna be between minus one and one, and same for the cosine, depending on what the angle is, and the edges are included, so you could get a full one and a full minus one. Uh, the tangent can actually get to a crap ton of values, it actually deals with infinity, and we'll look at that. But we don't care over much about it just yet, um, except that when you get into the programming side of things, uh, the tangent to something being infinite at the limit and never reaching the limit is a major pain in the back. So all of those have also correspondent uh, prime inverse functions. Uh, are they inverse? No, I don't think so. But anyway, they are the arc functions for all of those. So 
and for all of those what you have in the codomain again if you don't know the main codomain don't worry about it and that is the arc sine the arc cosine and you might have guessed it at this point is the arc tangent questions remain welcome now these are interesting in many ways um, because what happens and we will see it applied I swear what happens with all of these is that given a number so a number between minus one and one in these two cases any number in the case of the tangent it will tell you what the angle is so if and we will look at that I swear um, if we say we saw a little bit of these when we do the dot product if we say that one of the this is our hypotenuse and it's length one and that is why these are always between minus one and one by the way because uh, they can never exceed the hypotenuse these two sides are called the legs I found out uh, most of my trigonometry comes from Italian and some Latin so not super great at some of the English terms so neither of the legs uh, can ever exceed one now that is going to be for this angle and the arc sine arc cosine arc tan and so on is basically given the sine part so given one of the legs of the triangle uh, give me the actual angle and the sine and we'll say it, deals with this leg of the triangle whereas the cosine deals with this leg of the triangle hopefully this is all making sense up to here uh, again I'm relying on the chat to let me know if it does or it doesn't make sense and let me check super quick okay stream is still up uh, Twitch says we're excellent nothing less now and this is one of my bugbears with uh with my I really I really don't like this but uh, what can you do uh, in Maya that I know of there are no real atomic nodes for trigonometric functions they might have been added very very recently if they have I could never find them uh, you do have so it's one of the things that you will find a million libraries out there it's one of the first things that everybody writes is there the hello world equivalent of Maya is writing your own trig nodes I guess so what we have to do for the sake of exemplifying stuff is going to be using uh, mel expressions which I'm not a huge fan of but those actually have things like arc sine and sine and so on and it will be okay just for the sake of example it's just not something that I will want to do uh, on production rigs these days uh, well 2016 and on because uh, they kind of mess with parallel evaluation a bit not as much as Python nodes, Python nodes are hell, don't do that, learn C++, I will teach you C++, uh, but yeah. So with that said, um, there are a few rules to this, but the basic notions are pretty simple. So as this actually goes down the line, and actually, that's, sorry, that's, that, was a, that was a good question, uh, which I should address uh, right away to explain things. So in this convention, I'm gonna go clockwise and say, okay, uh, here I'm at zero as I go down in time, you know, this is gonna be 360 or two pi. That's great, except that Maya doesn't work that way. Now, uh, when I was talking about matrices, I did mention that they can be, well, there is definitely a handedness to 3D matrices. So, and rule for the handedness, if you ever see a viewport and you need to figure out what is going on, is that if you hold down your hand like that and some people will tell you the index is one letter or something else is one letter it doesn't really matter you can you can do it like that um your thumb is x so in the uh in the order you have your fingers it's x y and z if you put your hand like that and you put it against your maya screen i you should see something like down here it should be but it's probably going to be microscopic if the axis match this order, so x, y, and z like this, that's a right-handed matrix. It means that whatever you're using uses right-handed matrices. If it's the other way around, uh, so the uh, in case in the case of Maya's default position, the z is going to be coming towards you. The other way around is a left-handed matrix, and the x and y will stay the same, but the z will be going down the camera. So Maya uses right-handed matrices, OpenGL uses right-handed matrices. If I remember right, um, and I don't know if it's still the case because I haven't used it in ages, RenderMan used to be used to use left-handed matrices, which 
made sense, I guess, for a rendering engine because it meant that everything was in front of the camera. Um, so you basically could consider that everything that existed must have had a positive sign to it, uh, which meant that for some things you could use unsigned numbers and so on, that's, that was probably the rationale. Uh, or maybe somebody just thought it philosophically felt better for a rendering engine, but it's a pain in the butt. Left-handed matrices are more sinister. Yeah, you will you will actually find some good cases for left-handed left-handed matrices with uh, column order matrix matrices. To be honest, uh, they are arguably for what we do. They would arguably be superior, but the gods and the men have decided that we use right-handed matrices and that they're actually raw ordered. And somebody's saying Latin pun. I don't get the Latin pun. I'm sorry. Uh, you will have to explain it to me in detail later. Now, moving on. I am mentioning all of this. Uh, how do you really feel? Don't hold back. No, no, that's how I really feel. I don't feel all that strongly about conventions. So the interesting thing about something like that is that given any axis, uh, and I actually have a Maya screen. I don't know why I keep, well, I mean, I know why I'm using my hands to explain things like... Uh, Handedness, that makes sense, but I have a giant screen here now. Nerd. Uh, sinister means left in Latin. All right, I get it now. Actually, it's the same in Italian, but I just did not make the linguistical connection. You are too fine a punner for me. So, uh, Maya using right-handed matrices means that on any given axis, and I keep doing it, so in this case, let's say that these are axes, if you were rotating around the y-axis, positivity is going to be counterclockwise. Now, I was showing when I was discussing examples like that. So I'm rotating around the z because I want to work in 2D for a little bit, x and y. If I was to have a look here, you will find, and the text is probably going to be minuscule, but uh, hopefully you can uh, test it at home or whatever. You will find that going clockwise, my rotation is actually negative. So that's undesirable and it's something that you should be aware of and know. And it means that we're actually gonna do a very simple thing to resolve it, which is we are gonna work by Maya's evil laws, modify the geometry. It's not cheating. And I think I have a crap ton of modeling history on this stuff. Um, man. Why did I, whatever. I should just use shortcuts. I don't know why I'm still, like, I normally click menus to show people what I'm doing, but for stuff like this. Anyway, moving on. So if we do this, uh, possibly without the snapping, then our rotations are now gonna be positive and you might have a very hard time to see it. Actually guys in chat, um, please let me know how the readability of this stuff is. Uh, so this is now going to be a positive value. We're going to work off this convention from now on because it just makes things a lot simpler. Now, uh, I do suggest you do this at home. The applied part here is large part here is largely showing you just enough of Maya so that you can build very simple rig to understand what the hell you're actually doing. So that means you have to leave through a little bit of noodling and no, I did not do my shortcuts. No, whatever. So I still have a lot of shortcuts that I really need to port in. So let's say that we grab a massive sphere that occludes everything and make it less massive. And we are gonna call these our sign. And I'm actually gonna call it sign full word and so sure, we're going to do some surfacing as well. Uh, we are that advanced. And we're going to say that this is actually in the red, just because it's the first sign that we care about. It's the first item that we care about. And full screen, it's readable. Cool. Hopefully it stays that way. My concern is for people that run these at a... Um, at the lower resolutions, really. I think a 720 will be pretty hard to read. But for this stuff, I don't think it's really strictly necessary to know it. 
so we are going to also come on we're also gonna get as a cosine and i do suggest that you know don't do it with well sure look you know watch the video do it with the video but redo this stuff without actually watching the video as a learning thing i find that if you just parrot things well in my experience like teaching a few people when i let them just parrot things around they don't really you don't make the mistakes and if you don't make the mistakes you don't learn you have to find the five ways something fails before you actually understand the way it works that is a lot more profound sounding than i intended it to be but so be it now what we are going to do is just uh show the function like the nature of the function uh, first and we are going to get an expression so we want the angle that we're rotating the hypotenuse by we'll call it the hand of a clock and call it whatever you want now in this case and i haven't used my expressions in i don't know many years many many years but i am sure i can still create one given 15 or 20 minutes so create new expression uh, object sign attributes translate okay oh, i'm creating it on the yeah i'm creating it on the sign let's go and what i want there should be and it's just sign but so in here you actually have a bunch of functions that you're interested in and the expression itself and i don't think i can lock this window should be the sign of actually we have a simple enough name which is cool and we're rotating around the z uh is it gonna take that kind of shortcut yeah it is that is surprising i thought this would have been a complete disaster i'm surprised i actually got it working right away is it no it's not clearly so there might need to be a unit conversion switch down to 720 it's okay but you have to focus to read it back to 180 okay i am a dummy you do need to connect those uh what whatever so we say we will plug it in there the input I was positive I actually had that oh, whatever yeah as, as you can tell this is not what I normally do attribute not state no don't care for that See, this is why I don't use the expression editor, the factory one. But I don't use expressions in general, but. <sighs> Isn't it supposed to be fine like that? What is it, scene of input zero? No. Connection fail, input looks well because it's trying to connect itself. It should just do it. If anybody is more familiar than I am with expressions, please pitch in because this is getting silly. See, I should have actually rehearsed these. You have to specify the equal. Oh, yeah. So what is actually, you're right. I think you have to prepend the equal to, thank you. I completely forgot the silly syntax. Yep. So it should be, um, 
sign.ty equals, I think you have to use, somebody was reminding me, you have to specify the whole thing. I think if you have the output, just the equal is enough, but if you don't put the equal, the parser doesn't recognize it in, as an expression. Yeah, you, you can tell I do not use it much. Well, we'd be lucky, no, we're not. Already controlled by an expression keyframe, so yeah, just the equal should be okay. No. Jesus, good lord. Okay. Sometimes you just have to do this stuff from scratch. So, because that's going to create the stuff for me in theory. Um, so, sign dot, let's try it again. py equals this, um, yeah, the actual sign function of hi dot. Uh, RZ we said all right it we might have a win here possibly reverse it not entirely sure what people mean we reverse it all right so that's cool now what is happening here is the conversion I was talking about and they're right about that, I think, as well, at their first. Uh, well, the thing is, the editor is the one that you punch stuff in, and then it will actually create the expression for you. I don't think we need that. Okay, let's see if it still works for us. Yeah, it should be. So here's what's going on. Now, this angle is happening. Stuff is happening, but it's coming in converted. So it's being multiplied by 57 times. Now the sign actually takes uh, radian as radian angles as parameters. Don't forget, uh, thank you. Someone is being useful. Somebody reminded me to save. Uh, it's something that I asked of the last stream as well. So uh, when you create the expressions, you have options for convert units all or not and stuff like that. Now in theory, you should be able to connect without conversion, but because this was painful enough as it was, I am just going to grab the unit conversion node, set it to one so that no conversion happens, which means from here, this being of angle type, I get radians. And if this actually showed you input and output, you will see the numbers, which will be useful, but no. And in here, I finally receive radians, which are compatible with the actual expression itself and so on. So that's why I was harping on about it before. So remember that here, come on, whatever. Um, so remember here we're at zero. And then as we go down the circle, you can see the relationship. Now that relationship should actually be pretty obvious. And it is basically, if you imagine a train, well, if you don't imagine, actually, I can draw one because we have the technology. So the notion of this is that if you create a rectangle triangle of your traveling hypotenuse, and we're now going from zero to half pi in this direction, what you get when you run the sign is going to go from zero to one, as was said, and it's basically going to be this leg of the triangle. The cosine is quite simply the other leg of the triangle. So when you're at zero, I probably just, yeah, apparently there's a shortcut to reset colors. So when you're at zero, the cosine is actually one because it's a very, it's the long leg. It's the same of the hypotenuse. And when you're at 90 degrees or half pi, it's going to be at zero. And then it starts going in the negative. Whereas the sign uh, will actually go from zero to one to zero, and then it starts going in the negative because that's the other part of this, which is there are quadrants to the unit circle, and they are the usual x and x and y, you know, Cartesian that we've looked at before, and they determine the sign of what you get. Now I have to admit that. I don't love doing things in counterclockwise, uh, laying on the ground. I've done too many years of trig the other way around. So, but the basic idea is that in this direction, you basically have uh, x positive or uh, sine positive, 
and in this direction you have uh, minus x and which is also you know something that I find somewhat unintuitive about the counter counterclockwise kind of notation and in terms of the y in this direction you are uh, cosine positive or uh, y positive and in this direction you are cosine negative and that looks suspiciously like z which might be confusing and in this direction you are uh, y negative so that is actually pretty important because given uh, the trigonometric functions of an angle you can basically figure out in which of these quadrants are because this is going to be positive positive uh, this is going to be positive negative this is going to be negative negative and this is going to be negative positive so if you have any angle and you need to know in which quadrant you are uh, because maybe all you care is uh, what direction you're facing or maybe on top of having the angular value itself you need to figure out which way you're facing the combination of the cosine and sine will actually if you look at the signs will actually tell you which quadrant you are in um, it also happens to work as binary counting and hopefully that still makes sense and we can move on if it doesn't make sense let me know now what we yeah we're not doing too bad time wise i don't know if we'll get to do a lot about matrices but i think we're gonna get enough trig today now the other part that we care about is i am so tempted to just duplicate these but i shouldn't uh, yeah i really won't so the other part that we're interested in is actually showing the uh, the cosine and we do have the cosine here and in that case we're gonna use the translate x as a target so create new expression let's see if we can do it in one shot so cosine I'm already creating it on there so the attribute at the top is already telling me what I'm doing okay possibly who knows we'll find out uh, equals the cosine of we say hi dot rz I believe nope you have to specify the law sure so we're gonna do uh, what we're saying cosine dot uh, t in x is gonna be equal to that now here is okay obviously we need to convert that so hopefully this is now making sense and you can probably build something like that at home quickly enough and uh, i don't think i'm kind of well i might bother saving this scene you know the same way i've done others uh, but i think you really should go for the paces yourself so and hopefully you can see what is emerging out of this now the other interesting thing about this thing this whole uh, construction of the um, of the triangle as it is is that it's this is basically what is happening when you take a vector so a position in any point and you actually rotate it so that is what under the hood is going on when you run matrix operations and I'm not gonna go overboard with that um, so sorry it's it's just for some reason it's bothering me to no end that that is rotated and uh, we're not gonna do much in those regards but polysphere sure what were we using 0 0.0 not 0 0.05 I think sure uh, in those regards we do want to show the immediate practical application I guess cool long silence now I'm not gonna rerun the law I am just gonna steal where is it oh sure it's under the other 50 nodes that Jeez, man, the node editor some days, most days, all days. 
So if we now we've isolated the behavior on X and Y, uh, if we were to connect both of those here, it should be pretty obvious. Uh, well, what we're going to get should be pretty obvious, but why you will do it and what happens with the matrices hopefully will be mind blowing to you. So these, I think, is the cosine. Yeah, what else? We, yeah, that'll be fine. And for this one, we're using translate y. So here's what's happening, uh, and what will be happening if you were to be uh, using the actual uh, the actual matrix math, which under the hood is just going to run sine and cosine. I am actually not affecting the rotation of these. It's not parented under anything at all. And yet the effect is that of having a parent constraint uh, with the rotational inheritance, but without the positional inheritance and without the rotation being transmitted that way. So which is why as you move it, it's, um, it's basically always facing the same way. I am literally just grabbing the rotation of something and finding the displacement component of it and applying it to something else. That also happens, and I think we've done a little bit of this before, uh, that also happens to be a linearly scalable operation, which basically means that if you uh, want this to be anywhere else, you don't need to do any fancy stuff with the vectors. You can actually, well, doing something fancy with the vector will be exactly the same as multiplying the individual terms. So you could actually just grab these two numbers and multiply them by something. So hopefully still making sense. No, sorry, I need to drink. Now the tangent part of the circle is actually the one that shoots in the stratosphere. So we have established that we have established that if this is our triangle and we had the sine and cosine, as you basically move down the circle, and this, this is an approximation, like you can find a million, it's just what I can draw, you can find a million animated GIFs of trigonometry on the internet. Uh, the tangent is basically going to be how this actually uh, tenses a chord from this point. So what happens is that at zero, the tangent is zero, but as you go through the angles, it increases very, very, very fast. Whoops. It increases very, very fast um, when you start going past a certain point. And unlike the sine and cosine, there is a shortcut to turn the brush black. That is clear because I keep hitting it. I don't know which one it is. Oh, it's probably the picker. So there is, there is a time when you hit half pi where the tangent is actually infinite because um, it's basically not tangent at all anymore. The tensor is actually going to be parallel to where we're actually tending the chord from and that is infinite. And that is also why, and I, I am sure we did it, this is also why we were saying that tangent itself can be swinging between minus infinite and infinite. Oops. So if we actually want the domain of this, is it? Yeah, it's minus infinite to infinite. Now, this also means that if you use the arc sign and the arc cosine and so on, they can only create numbers that are between minus one and one. So if you need to run an arc cosine or an arc sine operation, you have to normalize first. You have to give it values that are between minus one and one. Uh, there are many useful things, signal, like when you want to generate a signal, you know, the sine wave is something like that. The cosine wave is the, well, that's completely wrong, actually. And this is a terrible rendition of a sine wave, but you get the idea. So this is your zero. And as you hit your uh, half pi or 90 degrees, you have your one, then it goes to zero again here, and then it goes to minus half pi and so on. I think, you know, this is going to be pretty clear. So when you want something, when you want to feed a value to 
uh, to something and generate the sine wave, you can take any value uh, because it will, you know, it won't mind whether there's a spin or not, and uh, and just feed it through a sine function, and you will get this kind of behavior. Not gonna dwell too much in there. Um, there's a million good uses for it though. Now, the tangent for this, do we really want to do it? Nah, I can't be bothered with it because it's not immediately useful. Uh, the, the tangent for this will basically be increasing up in this direction. Uh, again, chat, you're my sounding board. Let me know if it's all clear up to here. I think we are good with this part and we only have to introduce a uh, mnemonic for it. Now, there are trigonometric ratios and there's the law of cosine and there's the law of sine and so on. I really wanted to just get across the visual side of this and I'll do a quick a uh, practical example of this and then we'll look at the matrix math part of it but um, there is a super useful mnemonic which has been around for dog years which is uh, so katoa so tangents links out of the room sniffling <laughs> yeah yeah the tangent is unhappy it feels ignored but the tangent is a big boy and we'll deal with it so if you have these the important things you need to know to resolve any rectangle triangle uh, and all no rectangle triangles are basically built out of two uh, rectangle triangles so they're, they're just that's law of cosine and law of sine deal with those and they are just compositions of the basic uh, Pythagorean solutions and trig ratios um, for any given angle there are two sides uh, there are two legs one is the adjacent leg and one is the opposite leg and I don't remember all of the notations uh, but I do remember if I remember right the adjacency is something like that so if we have um, and normally you notate opposites uh, not normally but often you will find notated opposites so if you consider this the angle al uh, alpha then the capital A will be on the opposite side so you have that alpha is opposite to a or obviously the other way around as well now this is important because for any given angle you have an opposite you have let me clear up a little bit of space you have an adjacent and you have the hypotenuse the hypotenuse is never considered but um because otherwise you wouldn't know which one is considered adjacent and which one is considered opposite because uh, you would always have two adjacents now uh, the Sokato mnemonic basically means that the sine of an angle is equal to uh, opposite and uh, opposite divided by the hypotenuse the cosine of an angle is the adjacent uh, the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse and toa means that the uh, tangent of an angle is the opposite divided by the adjacent uh, out of curiosity how many people in chat actually knew the mnemonic or like use or remember these things from whenever they told you at school that these exist uh, I'm pretty curious now this is actually pretty useful and you use it all the time uh, when optimizing anything uh, and this basically tells you that given for a rectangle triangle given any two element uh, so any yeah math degree yeah people who have a math degree I'm sure you actually know this but uh, I'm talking about the uh, lowly rest of us that don't have a math degree so the this is basically all you need to solve a lot of problems with offsets and transforms and things like that oh, okay um it's good to see that people actually know it now the other important bit is to solve any other triangle uh if you get the perpendicular uh to the my kids came from school with this the other day <laughs> yeah having kids i guess is gonna force you to relearn some of the old stuff and now that you do CG you hopefully find an application for it so pretty much any triangle uh, can be divided into two triangles where the I think it's 
Fin the base rule is no, I don't remember it. There's there's a couple of um, you you can do this a number of ways, obviously. Um, but this basically lets you solve. They can teach me how to do my job. So this basically lets you solve any triangle by decomposing it, and a lot of laws are based on the by decomposing it into rectangle triangles. Uh, now, the obviously this complicates things a little bit, and that is where the law of sine and the law of cosine come into place. Now the law of cosines is largely derivative but distance based uh, to the law of sines, uh, which I mean. I don't know if I really need to actually uh, reiterate this. Luckily, Wikipedia is um, Creative Commons, and so is the Maya Developer Guide, by the way. So you can show it on streams and videos if you need to. Um, hopefully, we have seen enough that this is self-explanatory, I guess. But the um, the law of science is basically relating any tuples of angle to sine and this gets pretty important this is why i was saying the, the notation can be important uh, that usually you will find that the opposite is marked with the same letter uh, so if you have an angle capital b this is actually using capitals for the angles uh, i've seen it like this as well if the angle is b the opposite side is going to be the lowercase b length and this lowercase b actually is going to be notation wise let's do that as well just so you guys can read this stuff if you ever bump into it so the notation for a triangle that is notated like that is going to be so let me just go b a and c is going to be that uh, c as a side is uh, a b it's usually notated like that and that is pretty much a tuple notation for um for coupling items so and angularity and adjacency the they can be notated several other ways i don't want to spend too much time on this but uh, the part that we're interested in is here and that is that a is a divided the sine of a and if i was in school this would be a divided the sine of alpha to be honest uh, b divided is the same as b divided by the sine of b which is the same as c divided by the sine of c so what that means in practical terms, this, this is completely spasticated, but um, is that what you need for a triangle that is non-rectangle, so let's do it again, is uh, any three elements. And because this is, you know, a triplet of equalities, uh, literally any three elements, um, now the caveat to that is that three angles will not really do you um, so three angles just do not determine uh, a triangle because if you just know the angle it gives you the relay only the relationship between the sides but it will not give you the length of any of those sides so whereas three sides will actually lock the triangle in place uh, hopefully that still makes sense but yeah this is all you need to basically solve this and the reason it's three elements is the properties that we we're talking about before so for something like this if I want to solve for any of these four terms I can if I need to find C what I will be doing is basically do B by the sine of C uh, divided by the sine of B equals C so and you you know hopefully you can see how this goes up now moving on uh, law of cosine again I don't want to spend an hour on this but you can pretty much look it up once you know the law of sines uh, the law of cosine is basically gonna give you a more side friendly if you want to reduce things version of the law of cosine by the way this is also what you do non-iterative to bone IK with and several building blocks for more complex uh, non-iterative IK solutions. Whew, man. All right, so I am mentioning all of these because whenever you use matrices, this is basically what you're doing under the hood a lot. And we're not doing too bad. I'm gonna do a 15 minute stretch just to get into the matrices. So 
into the matrices side of it. I wanted to get the angular part of all of this done so that tomorrow we actually go and fix a bunch of components. I think I've explained this already, but the basic idea of a matrix is that it's a field, it's a linear field of numbers. So if you have a matrix, it has sides and the sides have size. And there's, there's a few things. I've talked about matrix multiplication. I might have given the impression that some things can be taken for granted, like multiplication and inversion and so on, which is just not true. So if I have two columns and two rows, this is a two by two matrix, uh, you will find that a lot of, and I do, uh, like I do personally hold that it's correct, you will find that a lot of, um, I have to do long division, <laughs> yeah, on paper stuff is tough. Um, that say that a vector is actually a matrix that has either one row or one column. I agree with that because otherwise the idea of multiplying a vector by a matrix becomes a special thing when it actually isn't. All right, so now the simplest way to look at a matrix, if we're looking at a 2D matrix purely for the sake of simplicity, is the matrix itself basically can be used to express a transform. Let me see, which is how you use it most of the time in 3D. And if you only had the one vector somewhere, this does have, you know, an X coordinate, which is the X value for that. So this is gonna have an X value and a Y value that basically say, okay, your position here but if you need to transform, if you need to describe more than that, then you need matrices. Now, again, I think I've mentioned this before, the simplest way to look at matrices, and we're going to say that we're going to be uh, row ordered, is the x-axis is going to be described, sure, pick a green color for the x-axis. Uh, the x-axis is going to be described here, the y-axis is going to be described here. Now, if you think of the axes themselves as a vector, so ignore the fact that they're your reference frame for now and think of them as just vectors. Uh, what you have is that this is actually, uh, the default position is gonna be uh, zero on the X and uh, one on the Y. So I can describe these normal axes as that. And my X axis is gonna be the opposite. So I can actually describe this thing, the actual frame set that I use to multiply things as uh, one zero and zero one. Now this is called an identity matrix. I don't want to go into identity because they're predicated on identity functions, but the for now take it as axiomatic. Uh, an identity something is something that once uh, multiplied by something else will not affect it. So the identity in normal algebra is one, anything multiplied by one stays one. The identity in matrices is something where if I had a matrix X of some type, actually let's call it M, and I multiply by some other matrix, matrix um, if this is an ID matrix, the result will be M. And this will be true depend, like, regardless of whether it's uh, pre-multiplied or post-multiplied. Uh, anything that will give me a result here that is not M is not an identity matrix. That's pretty much all you need to know for now. Um, if you do these things on paper, it will probably be pretty obvious. Now, I might have given the impression that you can multiply any matrices. That is not true. So if you have a matrix and you want to multiply by... <laughs> If you have a matrix and you want to multiply by some other matrix, and by the way, notation wise, again, I'm sorry if I'm doing a lot of theory, but I think it's pretty important that you guys get to, I'm not doing as much applied as I wanted to. It's pretty important that people become able to actually read the stuff that they need to study to me. So if you want to multiply matrix M by matrix N, they can be any arbitrary size. Uh, they need to share the inner size of the multiplication. So if I have, uh, M and N, well, that is that is actually also not quite correct, but um, yeah, sorry, anyway, scrap that. Um, if I have M by N, uh, then 
if they're both square matrices, the result of that is actually also going to be a square matrix. And a square matrix is uh, a matrix that has the same size for both sides. So, sorry, uh, also, I have to backtrack for a little moment, like for a moment there. Um, if you want to obtain um, a matrix that is of the same uh of the same size, like even if it's transpose rows and column, uh, you need to have a compatible inner part. That's what I wanted to say. You can actually do arbitrary multiplications, uh, arbitrary size multiplications, but we're not interested in that. We're interested in a subset of linear algebra. Now, the other thing that is interesting, I guess, is that you do need row compatibility to do this operation. And we'll look at why very soon. Yeah. So if you multiply two matrices like these, and by the way, if you want to look up any courses on these, I can warmly recommend Khan Academy. I had a look at their stuff, like quickly browse through when I was helping someone and it's, uh, and it's pretty impressive. Um, now, what happens when you multiply a matrix? Let's not confuse things. So let's, let's stick to square matrices for a little bit longer. I don't need to complicate for the general case. So what you're going to deal with in CG, like 90% of the time, is, uh, is square matrices. So what you do in terms of the multiplication is you basically take each row and you multiply it by each column, right? So um, if you remember when we talked about the dot product, this is exactly a dot product. So if I have a row and that row is 0 and I have another row and that row is 1 and then I have columns, and those are zero and one. This is confusing as well. So those are zero and one. If I want a resulting matrix, uh, and this is the standard convention, what you get is zero, zero goes here, uh, zero, one goes here, and one, zero goes here. Sorry, what am I doing here? Uh, so this will be, yeah, no, it was great. Zero, one goes here, uh, then, one zero goes here and then one one goes here, which also um, which also nods back to a lot of stuff that you can like when, when you use two by two matrices, there's a lot of stuff or quadrants, there's a lot of stuff you can do with bit masking, even in higher dimensions, but it's pretty straightforward for these things. So, and the way it works is you basically take each row as if it was a vector and that in turn is going to contain you know the x and the y for these axes and you multiply by whatever numbers you have here and then you add them so what you will get to do this is that you will get so if this is matrix m and this is matrix n in here you would have um, m0 i'm confusing things a bit with these mixed notations but hopefully it still makes sense you would have um, m0 0 by n zero zero remember dot the product then plus the other part of it which will be m zero one by n one zero it's it's actually surprising like I can do this stuff on paper super quick but it's surprisingly hard to actually do it uh, while talking about it absolute maximum respect for the people that do it for a living so uh there's there's a pattern to this stuff uh and hopefully you can see it here but this is literally all of this is about uh this is all you do you dot product you take the row and you dot product it by the column then you take uh and that that gets you the combination so if it's row zero and it's column zero you end up here if you take row zero and column one, so you take this thing and column one, you're basically ending up here, talking about the results. So you're doing these, then you're doing these. Then you take the second row, which means you're now working in this row, you multiply by the first column, you end up here, and so on. That is literally all, the, all that there is inside the matrix multiplication. Now, what that gets you, and if you, I do suggest that you do a little bit of it on paper or you noddle it together. It, will, it might take you a while and it's going to be, it's going to be pretty gruesome. It's, it ends up, especially with factory nodes, it, it ends up being a lot of stuff. Uh, encoder scripting is probably going to be clear for you if you're good enough to actually 
uh, get yourself in a situation where you can add a few numbers. But what that basically does is when you multiply matrices, it allows you to consider these as a transform set. So this is our ID matrix, but if I wanted to describe a rotation of that kind, and this is taking me a while, but I hope that this is, you know, this is helping that this is clear. Now, if I wanted to describe a rotation, and what are we going to do? Let's say that our word is actually pink. Now, what that matrix is actually going to contain, and this, this is why you need two vectors for something like that. And if you want a rotation matrix in 3D, you will actually need three tri vectors. So what you get is that you have an X component to the X axis and you have um, Y component to the X axis. And then you're going to have the same for the Y and you're going to have a Y component to the Y axis and a Y component and an X component to the Y axis, which is when we're talking about this stuff, uh, which is what you get if you write down the matrix, so this ends in here, and this ends in here. Hopefully it's still making sense. Now for, <clears throat> for 3D rotations, it's literally just adding one dimension. The entirety of these to work in higher dimensions is just extending it. For what we do in 3D, as I was saying before, it's a lot easier to reason about things if you don't consider things like sharing and so on. So when you expand to 3D, uh, remember this is just a rotation matrices. What you get is a Z axis uh, as a new row. And because these cannot be swiveled around in a further axis, obviously you will need that additional component for each of the other rows because they could be pointing anywhere. But that is it. That is literally all that you need. Uh, all the operations remain the same. You walk down the row and you go, okay, this is this row. You walk down the column and it's like, okay, it's this column. You take all the terms, you multiply them reciprocally, you add them together and you put them in. You do the dot product and you move on. You're just doing it for more rows and more columns. Now, hopefully you can see how for four by four matrices, this is actually a considerable number of operations because for each of these items in a 4x4, four four, uh, you will be taking blocks of 4x4 four four and adding them together. So what you have is for each point, it's that 4x4 four four operation with mix additions and multiplications. Now, when all you want is to actually just rotate something on the one axis, when people do a lot of like chaining matrices together, that is incredibly wasteful. So if you're trying to roll something uh, on, you know, you have a child or something, remember we're describing a transform. So a transform matters the most for the children or the inheritors or the affected uh, of the transform itself. So if we're just trying to rotate something, um, sorry, to inherit the rotation of a transform, it's fairly wasteful to go through a lot of, uh, through a lot of matrices. It's a lot more efficient, and this is true for both the programming and the nodes, especially if you want a fairly flat and versatile interface, something that you can actually refactor and think about. Um, this is super true about everything in rigging. I have belabored, like I've beaten this horse to death to the point that the family is asking for the corpse back, but um, I cannot possibly overstate, like for the people that have skipped trig, and they started using matrix modes and they think that they got it and they probably did they don't they know what the results of the various inversions of matrix modes and so on do and completely script the trees keep the trigonometry part and just use matrices all the time um that is terrible you will write horrible code very inefficient you will complicate your rig more than necessary uh learn the trick what happens when the two axis vectors don't remain right angled or orthogonal in their relationship? So yeah, there's there's a leading question from somebody that has a math degree. That's that's why I was saying, I don't want to talk about sharing and skewing and things like that. Um, but it is a good question because people should probably know at least what to avoid. So I have mentioned this before. We talk in this case for transforms for rotation. 
we have to assume for now, so you either prepare the matrix to be the case or you assume that your chain of transference makes it legal. We're dealing with orthonormal matrices. Orthonormal means that each component is normal, so it's the length of your unit, which means it's a unit vector in length of one, and it's orthogonal in so that any set of axes that you describe is gonna be orthogonal to each other. So if you have the classic 3D matrix, there's gonna be 90 degrees between any set of two axes that you can pick. Uh, if the matrix is, like if things are non-orthogonal, non-normal, things get a bit more complicated. Now, if they're not normal, actually that might be worth discussing. So if that matrix was non-normal, beside the fact you lose out a lot of uh, opportunities for optimizations, but let's say that this is one, uh, this is 0 0.9, and this is, I don't know, it looks like a 1.9 maybe. So what happens when the matrix is non-normal, but it's uh, still orthogonal, is that you have, congratulations, you have basically just represented scaling. Uh, now that makes things a little bit more interesting in some regards. Uh, and deriving the scaling from the actual rotational matrix, like you can incorporate things, but deriving the scaling from the actual rotational matrix, not always a great idea. Uh, separation tends to work better, even better it will be having free floats for scaling, your translation has another free floats, uh, or four possibly, and uh, a vec force or four floats for a quaternion orientation. But we're talking about matrices, um, if it's not normal, you're probably describing the scaling on that axis. Um, if it's non-orthogonal, to answer the leading question, I am both grateful and spiteful for that question. So this is orthogonal, but maybe this is not, these are not. Then what you get, and you, I'm sure you've seen it before, is that you get distortion. So your transform says they travel inside that space will distort by some amount. And that kind of sharing and distortion can be pretty nasty. So there's also a lot of optimizations you lose. Uh, and uh, so I'm I'm starting to eat into the Q&A. No, no, it's good, man. Uh, the person who asked the question was saying, sorry, dude. No, no, no do ask the questions. Um, so I lost my train of foot for a second. So I'm eating into the Q&A stage, but um, uh, ask, uh, start asking anything right now and I'll pick it up in the last five minutes. So why is this important? Now, uh, <clears throat> I don't quite want to run the numbers, but this is what we're doing in Maya and the applied part turned out to be super slim. What I did here with this yellow item here, um, by modifying the translate is I have basically parented this object under the rotational part only of this thing. So off of this, I am getting a rotation. If you think of this rotation, I'm getting the sine and cosine out of it. If you remember what we talked about for the unit circle, you might start seeing the relationship where you go, okay, I have taken the sine and cosine of these two things, right? And I have, that, that was an angle, right? So I have rotated the x-axis by that much and I've rotated the y-axis by the same amount. And this is why I'm saying normality, uh, orthogonality is pretty important. Otherwise, this part gets pretty tricky. Um, but it just happens to be that because I want to describe this rotation and my offset looks like that, and this is the part where I was hoping to get to a lot sooner, but I did not. So there's one bit in the Maya documentation that if you don't know what's going on, will confuse the hell out of you. But if you know what is going on, is actually uh, pretty straightforward, where it tells you, if you look for any transformation matrix, uh, it will tell you transforms in Maya are computed like this. And you go, wow, like, I mean, do you really need all of that? I hope that internally it's a bit more optimal than these and they're not running some, I don't know, by the look of it, probably, you know, 1500 microps <laughs> every time you transform something. Uh, and this is why I was saying I don't like using pivots because they add to that chain. But what they do is they tell you, okay, I have a scale pivot point, I have a scale, I have a shear, I have a scale pivot translation, rotate pivot point, rotate orientation, rotation, and so on. 
that thing that people do where they just grab these couple mattresses which happens to be what i've done in so far um just to show what you can do with it uh, shouldn't be the only tool you have it's important that you learn what the sub ops are and what they're saying with these is that if i have an angle and we're talking about transform series so we're going to use theta and i want to know okay to rotate something um let's say on the z axis uh, which is coming towards us by this much what do i need to do so i need to produce a matrix that has been offset like this now that means that my x instead of being one zero like it was before will have um, a y component that is going to be uh, remember the unit circle we drew that is going to be the sign of that angle so at zero that y component like the sign is going to be zero and my axis is going to be flat which means it's forward so the y component on my x-axis is going to be the sign of theta or theta or whatever kind of pronunciation you want i'm italian um, i can mess it up now similarly same thing we've seen before this other part you know we we have this square built around this hypotenuse which is what we're doing with the rotation is actually going to be the cosine of theta and not dissimilarly the y before uh it had uh, nothing like the way it was lined up it basically had uh, nothing going on on the x-axis so that suggests that if you want zero at zero uh, it will be the sine of theta and now i'm gonna make a mistake here and then i will correct it uh, and it's uh, what am i doing here i'm kind of losing my train of thought okay so and the y component of y which at id will be one will be the cosine of theta now you might uh you might have noticed that if i'm rotating this thing like this the <clears throat> the x seems pretty correct like this because as i move this way this should be consistent but when i rotate by that angle uh by my z um sorry down down the z axis i don't know if like the whole hand wiggling thing makes sense despite being italian and not practiced in it now what i'm doing with the x side of things as the angle grows positive is i'm going into the negative side of the x so these should probably be minus the sine of zero now if you look what am i doing here sorry if you look at what they're telling you here this probably i'm actually assuming i hope i'm not wrong because i'll make a fool of myself yeah there you go no it's not too bad um they will be showing you pretty much this so you have the four by four matrix but if all you want to do is rotate thing down the z all they care about is the cosine of that rotation on the z the sine of that rotation on the z you do nothing on the z axis because if you have that you know three fingers thing and you're rotating around this think about it for a second as you do that these as a vector your z axis as a vector has not been transformed nothing has happened to it there's no need to apply any operations to it so when you see something like this i hope this is obvious enough there you go now it's obvious when you see that people talk about um transformation matrix and matrix op that are tied to angles and stuff like that this is what they're talking about these 2d transferring that we've done here uh which we're just affecting the position of something with but we'll get to the rest is literally a roll around the z and each of the three axes has to be treated separately and that is also why the rotation order matters and the rotation order will basically determine the order of these operations so despite this being a 2d rotation this is actually what is going on if you even if you want a four by four matrix uh, because we, you're dealing with full transforms all you need to do is populate the rest with the um with the id matrix I don't know why I use the commas. They're probably well, I'm kind of used to this notation. In a lot of notations, you'll find the sim like the single items 
uh, not separated like this. Hopefully still clear. Man, this has been a marathon. If people don't find it useful, I'm gonna quit this. Um, so there you go. You, it's, it's important that you know trig. It's important that you practice on 2D stuff because it all is just escalating these very, very basic things. Like this whole thing is the angular component of something down the unit circle. And while these, I'm sure we have one around, uh, while the unit circle itself might look bidimensional because we've talked about it in those terms, uh, whatever, I should just say where I was. While it might look bidimensional, these actual operations are unidimensional. The unit circle is just a way to, you know, represent something conveniently. Uh, but what you're doing as you go through angles here is going down a linear space, which is between zero and two pi. Chat, we only have three minutes to go. Tell me this made sense. Well, or maybe it didn't make sense, but that's fine. Um, Cause I am gonna shut it down in a couple minutes. Now, uh, what else did I, what can I do in two minutes if I don't get questions? Probably nothing significant. So uh, we'll go back to that page for a moment. Made sense to me. Yeah, a mathematician is saying it makes sense to him. So that's, that's either pretty good or pretty bad. I don't know. Um, it makes sense. And I now have a new hammer. Yeah, good stuff. All right. So out of curiosity, I know I know quite a few people in chat, um, and a lot of you. I know you've been using matrix math. I know you've been taking vectors, and multiplying it by multiplying them by matrices, and so on. Did you ever take them down to going? Well, you know what? I'm actually just going to construct something much smaller and use that. So it will be more obvious when it comes to code. But if you are just trying to roll something down its z-axis. Um, I have seen people doing it in the API, so this, this might not make a ton of sense to those who don't write code, um, but I've seen people going like, okay, I have an angle. I want to rotate something on the Z by 10 degrees. So this is my theta, and I know that it's gonna be on the Z, and I see people going like, okay, I'm gonna construct an Euler rotation. And somebody pointed out, I'm pronouncing Euler like an animator, I know, I know it's Euler, and I, you know, I was even used to the Greek pronunciation, but I've been corrected to the wrong thing so many times that you might have to cope with it. I am hating myself right now. So people will go, okay, I'm gonna construct an Euler rotation out of these, and I'm gonna go zero, zero, and may maybe they're even smart and connect, like convert that to radians right away. So whatever, the 10 degrees are. And then they go, okay, I have this. So I need to multiply by something else. I want to get a transform out of this. So I might get a transform matrix, a Maya transform matrix. Uh, what is it? M transformation or transform? I don't remember. I actually pff, had the docker right there. Uh, transformation matrix. Yeah, transformation matrix. Um, and then you know that's that's an empty one and then they go okay i am actually gonna set this thing to this and maya doesn't know for the record it's really hard to optimize at the micro level this kind of stuff it takes some really absurd tricks that are impossible to maintain uh, so every time it will have to run a lot of zero ops and you can only hope that a mix of compiler and cpu is helping you through a little bit but you're wasting a ton of operations so they will set that to the Euler and they go, okay, I have these. And the other matrix, and this is courtesy of Maya, might be an M float matrix. So what they do is they will take these magic matrix and out of it, get an M matrix, which is doubles. And they don't have something that gets you straight to float. So then they need to cast these to an M float matrix. And finally, they multiply this, which we have seen is a not inconsiderable number of operations. Remember, these by these, uh, you know, multiply each, add them all together, then these by these, and so on. Count the ops. It's, you know, their modes and their adds, which are pretty fast, but not ideal. 
So finally, that expensive operation, which is not an X circle, by the way, do not notate like that, I'm just being silly here, um, gets them, you know, a matrix that they will then probably have to convert back and forth several times. Now, if you know that this is all that row and the row is something that happens so often, so very often, all you want to add is a bloody row to a transform. The row is just this, you have one angle, get the cosine of that angle, you only compute it once and you use it twice, right? Get the cosine of that angle, then get the sine of that angle. I don't know why I'm doing the arrows, they don't help, do they? Get the cosine of that angle and get the sine of that angle. Then you all you need is three numbers. And then those three numbers need to only, because this is an ID matrix and things hold true for subsections of a matrix, uh, all you need to do is run a two by two operation on a very small subset of your two matrices. And you don't need to leave flow, you don't need to do all these complex things. Just please do it this way. So very soapboxy, very preachy, but this is pretty dear to me because I've seen the whole, you know, I have learned the matrix, I am now Neo and I will conquer the world like done way too often. Trig is important. I don't like it. I hate trig, but it's undeniable that it is one of the most important things that you can learn. All right, we are over, but I hope that this was useful. Uh, a lot preacher and a lot more theory. I promised applied math, but uh, this is very, very theory. Well, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it, but I'm glad I did it because tomorrow we're actually going to go through the rig and not use any of this fine stuff because I'm not going to write code, but uh, hopefully a lot of the stuff that we're going to be doing will make a lot of sense, a lot more sense. Last note, uh, things that you should probably know. There's other operations with matrices that you can and cannot do depend on the type of the matrix. So I have mentioned that matrix inversion is a thing. So if you, in this case, where is it? If you have this amount of effort that got the matrix in that place, you know, if you invert it, where is it? If you invert it, you will actually get whatever effort is required to bring that matrix back to the back to its origin state not every matrix is invertible um square matrices are always invertible which is very good and very convenient we only work with those in cg well not only but most of the time when you work with transforms it makes sense to have square matrices so you're fine there's another operation that i might or might not have used that's called the transpose so if you go down the diagonal of a matrix, that is called um, that is the that is representative of the determinant of a matrix, and in the case of an ID matrix, it will be a sequence of ones. There is a lot of convenient properties to that. When you hear about transposing a matrix, it's basically if you figure like you will find animation of literally that if you figure that your Matrix is basically this as a piece of paper and you run a rope down the middle, flip that rope. That's what the transpose of a square matrix is. This number will end up there. The determinant remains exactly the same because it's on the pivot point. Uh, and if it was a bigger matrix like that, you know, you would end up with this here and this here and so on. Uh, that is an inversion. Sorry, that is a transpose. If your matrix, last thing I'm gonna say, if your matrix is orthonormal, which is why I am fond of orthonormal matrices and I'd rather have several pieces of decomposed data rather than the one catch-all matrix that does sharing and all of that, is that inversion is expensive, but if you have an orthonormal square matrix, your transpose, which is just copying some data around, shuffling some data, is the same of your inversion. So it's a pretty big optimization. I have at this point gone over and gone full nerd, so I am done. I will take two further minutes of questions if there are any, otherwise I reckon I'm really done. On a scale from zero to 10, how preachy and so boxy was this stream? Just the last part of it. I think the last part was pretty so boxy. So if you're following these on YouTube, like this is the part where the long silence ensues. 
on Twitch, there's um, there's a delay. Oh, 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 Ryan is on fire today. I am not Ryan, by the way. I'm Raphael. So on the <clears throat> to the question on a scale, you know how preachy was this? Ryan's response was three point fourteen. Yeah, Ryan wins the chat today. So on on a scale from zero to three hundred and sixty. All right, I'm gonna call it. It seems that there are no real questions. Um, though there was a very real answer. I am gonna stop the recording. If you're on YouTube, you're not gonna hear any more after this. Thank you for watching it. Get on the streams if you haven't. They're pretty awesome. Thank you.